when he walks into a room or anywhere that he is, he is completely at that moment directed to what does God want him to do at that moment? His existence, his soul, its force, its energy, its godliness. Power walks in, energy walks in, godliness walks in, and it's sensed. There's this charge in the air. You sort of relate to this holy person that has just come into your midst, and it's that powerful enigmatic force that is the Rebbe. Especially when we discuss the importance of Jewish education. I came out with a sense of uh, elation and inspiration uh, that I have met a great leader of the Jewish people. Some holy man who God has endowed with special powers that is sitting there and caring about you and I as we sleep peacefully, communicating with God, trying to formulate a plan to make the world a better place. That's the Rebbe. His main thrust is bringing into the fold uh, Jews who are gradually or have already lost their Jewish identity. And he brings them back by kindling a fire of uh, Jewish solidarity and identity and love. And I think this is a, a, an extraordinary achievement. I honor the Rabbi in the work he's done, in the example he set, and the inspiration, therefore, that he has given to many, many people and will continue to give so long as he will live. And I wish him many, many more years in doing the work that he is destined to do. It is due to his influence, to his presence, that Jewish awareness and Jewish education have reached unprecedented heights on almost every continent. Is there a place under the sun where Chabad emissaries have not carried his words of tolerance rooted in Ahabat Israel, in the love for Israel, which really by extension means love for humanity? He has the two unique and necessary characteristics of a truly great religious leader. Number one is a vast and truly global vision of an ideal future, of what we talk about as the messianic age. And number two, he has restless urgency and practicality in making that vision actually happen. And it's those two qualities, the prophetic and the practical, which come together so powerfully in him and the movement that he has so transformed. who preceded the Rebbe uh, lived for the most part uh, either in Lubavitch 
are in larger cities in Russia. And uh, therefore, though they were very influential and looked up to by Jewish people all over the world, their influence was somewhat limited by the milieu and the topography of where they lived. Uh, the instant media did not exist in those times, and various pronouncements of the Rebbe would not circulate the world as they do today instantaneously. Uh, the Rebbe's administration has been here in this country, in New York, uh, really at the vortex of world activity, and uh, the conglomerate of institutions that he has built uh, over the years uh, are scattered around the globe so that he is capable today of saying something and it is heard and uh, recorded and studied instantaneously in, in communities all over the world. And people listen to what the Rebbe has to say. They look toward the Rebbe's pronouncements in uh, communal matters and Jewish matters and world's, world events, current events. For many, many generations, there was not anybody that had this capacity of leadership, which means the insight and the foresight. The, the seeing what the problems are and foreseeing what has to be done. In, in fact, we had a great number of scholars, all levels, but we didn't have enough leaders. Historically, in, the, in terms of our, our own generation. I mean, people are not used to that kind of relationship with the Rebbe. In Europe, that relationship with the Rebbe was very common. I mean, many people had Rebbes. Uh, and then historically, in the past, there were such relationships, such as Moses, Isaiah, Joshua, the various prophets in every generation, the various leaders in every generation. However, in our own modern times, because of the tremendous dissipation of the Jewish people, the exile, the disbursement of our people to various countries, and growing up, so to speak, with a rabbi-teacher image rather than a rebbe image, that kind of a relationship indicates one that's more relatively comfortable with us, one that can relate to our everyday experience because that person is an everyday kind of person. The Rebbe is not an everyday kind of person. His greatness is a comprehensive greatness. It covers so many fields, so many areas. He is primarily a religious leader. He is a great tzaddik. People believe in his personality as one that could really help Jews throughout the world. His prayers are considered prayers that have great influence with God. That's the belief of so many hundreds of thousands. You have just to be in New York on Sundays when people queue up by the thousands to look at his eyes and to get his, his blessing. He's a great religious leader. He's a great national leader, which means even non-believers, secularists, believe in his greatness, believe in his love of Israel, believe in his leadership. He is a social leader which means he takes all walks of life, all Jews from all walks of life, as equal. He gives the treatment to every Jew as if he was the only Jew on earth. He gets interested in the smallest details of people who write to him. He gets letters by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. He reads all of them, as far as I understand, and he tries to answer everybody. You don't find any leader on the political arena, on the religious arena, on the social arena, on the arts arena, that is interested and that loves every pe person from all walks of life. He is a lover of Jews. He is a lover of man. He, he is admired by non-Jews alike. I spoke to senators. I spoke to members of Congress. I spoke in Israel to political people. I spoke to professors in universities. I spoke to mathematicians, to lawyers, to, to medical people. All of them have that kind of admiration. He's a philosopher. He knows he physics. He, he, he finds himself very well in chemistry. He has explored the Talmud. He knows all the Hasidic writings. He speaks, never uses any paper. When he speaks, he could speak for hours without using one single paper. He has a memory that is uncomparable. When you put all that together, you ask one question. Is there any other human being of that stature? And you close your eyes and try to see all the leaders you know about, all the leaders you read about, and you find that he is one gigantic person that goes in the same line like Maimonides of his time, 
was the greatest Posseg, the greatest philosopher. And, and, and among the living Jews today, certainly the most interesting, the most charming, the most fascinating, the most comprehensive leader of Judaism today. The Rebbe has been an extraordinarily inspirational leader in taking the, the traditions of our people and the joys of being Jewish and, and communicating it in a very modern context throughout America, throughout the world, and doing it in a way that's fascinating because there are people who would look at uh, the Lubavitch community and say, well, you know, this, this, is, this is a group from another time. But the, the genius of the Rebbe has been to take the timeless message of Hasidism and relate it to the contemporary world and to do it in a way that is understanding and tolerant to create this message. We're not going to criticize you, individual Jewish person, man or woman, for what you're not doing. We're going to urge you to come with us step by step to improve your life and to make uh, the community, the, the, the broader community, uh, better than it would otherwise be. And of course, the heart of that is education. You can't lead, you can't understand, you can't teach, you can't live a full uh, life without uh, understanding and without knowledge of, uh, of the law, of the Torah. And, uh, and uh, of course, that's been the great work of the Rebbe. The Rebbe managed to hide himself. Other Rebbe's managed to hide himself from, uh, from, from the world in general, but at least for Hasidim they were revealed. The Rebbe was managed to hide himself even from the closest people. Well, the Rebbe Schlitter was born in 1902, in spring 1902, in the city of Nikolaev in Ukraine. There his grandfather was the rabbi of the city. The Rebbe's first few years was in Nikolaev, till about five, six years later, his father was nominated to be the rabbi of the large city of Dnepropetrovsk. Then it was Yekaterinoslav. So they moved there. So in the next couple of years, Rabbi Schlitter was living with his parents in Petrovsk. He was a very, very quiet person. He wasn't a, a leader of the gang of children. He was, in fact, always, uh, if you want to call it, almost a loner in the fact that because he, he was so in, into what he was studying and what he was doing. It wasn't until the early 20s that he, in fact, even came to see the previous Rabbi. There's a book which is called Hayyim Yayim. It describes the life story of each one of the Rebbe's of Lubavitch, the seven Rebbe's, very in brief. About the Rebbe, it says he was born on the 11th day of Nisan in the year 1902. Then the next thing is when his wedding was. In between, there's a few words which say everything about the Rebbe. He studies assiduously with unbelievable fervor and he succeeds. And it is known that the Rebbe in his childhood was already writing letters to the biggest scholars at that time, and they always thought they're talking to a big rabbi. They didn't know this was a child. He was a tremendous scholar. He was definitely a prodigy. He, as well as, as his brother, Ari Leib, were, in fact, tremendous minds, and they were known throughout the city uh, as being incredible people. The Rebbe's brother and the Rebbe would uh, compete with each other uh, in various different Things. One of them, they would love to learn languages. So he, the Rebbe uh, would have an English dictionary, and he would try to see how many words he could learn from the dictionary and, and understand the meaning and learn them quickly. And they would compete with each other, and it was like a brother type of rivalry. It's well known that the Rebbe does speak, in fact, many, many different languages. In general, there are three periods in his life, the period when he was completely closed in himself. People didn't know much about him. He used to be mostly in Dnepropetrovsk and studying for himself. Second one, when he was in the college, and the third one, when he came to United States in summer of 41. The Rebbe grew up in a house whose father was a great Kabbalist. So the Rebbe is what not... Mean, Kabbalist? He, he was very into the study of Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, uh, things relating to creation, names of gods, different compilations of words which have uh, power and meaning, uh, and uh, basically explaining a lot of different uh, events which take place 
between angels and, and uh, uh, different souls, mystical type of uh, studies. So it's important to note that the Rebbe, even as a child, was surrounded by this type of education, not only of learning the Talmud, and not only of learning the things which he learned in, as in Cheder, but in fact he was surrounded by a father who would speak often very, very lofty concepts which most people wouldn't speak. Inasmuch that we know about Bar Mitzvah, the Rebbe knew already the whole Talmud by heart. The Rebbe has never discussed any of this. When he was about 15, 16, the, there used to be the period when the government forced debates between the Yevsekzia, the Jewish department of the communists, and the religious Jews. So his father sent him to stand as the, his representative by the debate. We knew he's a holy man, he's a great man. We had to take away his time. If you talk to him, you take away his time. So he wouldn't take away time of his learning. If you talk to somebody for five, ten minutes, we take away his time from sleeping. A perfect gentleman, very, very uh, humble, very extremely humble. But, uh, but radiating with, with Torah and with everything. Now the reason why the Rebbe never let anyone know anything about his personal life, I would say, because this is what it says in the Torah, in Parsha Behaloischa, Veha'ish Moshe Anav Me'od Mikol Ha'adam Asher Al Pnei Ha'adama, which means and Moses was the most humble person on earth. That same Moses, that he took out the Jewish people out of Egypt, he is the one that went up on the mountain of Sinai, and he was 120 days in heaven, and he brought down the Bible to the world. He could be the leader of the world only one way, if he is humble. Even though officially Reb Levi Yitzchak, his father was the chief rabbi, uh, but when the Rebbe was here, he was really taking care of the situation. Chief rabbi of a city, it's not only sitting in the house and answering questions. It's a leader of the community. And it's the connection with the city government, and it's a connection, you know, a political, uh, it's political work. He was really helping his father in, in the work when he was already 15. Everybody that knew him was very impressed. When, he, when the Rebbe got married, when the, the greatest the giants, Talmudical giants in Poland came to the wedding. This was very well known in, in all of Russia. His father was a great man, the Rebbe's father and the Friedrich Rebbe knew very well all about the Rebbe as a child and as a young boy, and I'm sure that that's what led to, to choose him for his daughter. The Rebbetzin, being a very, very brilliant woman, I'm sure recognized the Rebbe's brilliance right away, and I'm sure that this was just the most wonderful thing to her, to know that she's going to, receive, to have such a wonderful husband. She knew the greatness of the Rebbe, probably more so than any other woman in, in the past, because she herself was the daughter of a Rebbe, Instead of being devoted to being a wife, to be happy for herself and having whatever she needs for herself, she never detracted from anything that the Rebbe would have to do for the Hasidim, for the rest of the world, uh, because of her own self. It's not for us to even question why God did not grant them an offspring. We don't know what God's reason for it, but we would nobody would ever discuss it with her, because we understand that's a God-given thing and that's not something for us to discuss. Immediately after the Rebbe got married, he would begin to study in Berlin, at the University of Berlin. Um, he began uh, his program of study. Uh, his uh, major was engineering with a math minor. Uh, and he did dedicate a lot of time in studying uh, various different math, extensive math courses. He continued his stay in Berlin up until the Aryanization laws instituted by Adolf Hitler. Um, and once there began the expulsion of Jewish students and professors from the university, one of the people who were on this list of expulsion uh, was, in fact, the Rebbe. Uh, at that point on, he continued his studies within Paris, um, attending uh, the University Polytechnique, uh, and he continued. He received his degree from there, and he continued living in Paris up until the beginning of World War II. When Paris came under um, threat of attack, the Rebbe then uh, relocated from Paris and then went to uh, Nice and then to Marseille. And from there, he eventually made his way to the United States. In the same period, the, the, his father-in-law says to his office, hundreds and hundreds of letters that I write, if they are meaningful letters, write them a copy. Because he is supposed to edit everything that is being printed 
in Warsaw and at Wotsk. So he was sitting in Berlin and editing everything, all in the same time that obviously we would expect him to sit and study in school. So we see that the whole concept of school was just a little, little part of, his, of those days. He went to college, I guess, because as the previous Rebbe wanted, that he should have the degree that when he will have to use it for Torah purposes, nobody should be able to say, you don't know what you're talking about. The Rebbe had all these degrees. He amassed a master's degree in engineering. He worked uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for a period of three and a half years. Um, this was due to the fact that he was a new immigrant here in the country, and we were in wartime, and everyone had to do, had to contribute in some way. The Rebbe's work was considered classified. He used to come home through the, on the subway, and he had, where his office is today, he had his own machni, the was, the office was over there then. We used to work there until late at, late at night, most of, almost every night. All the activities of Lubavitch, the network in all the cities, he started running right then, in, right in the beginning of 1942. There was just a little yeshiva here, so when uh, the Friedrich Rebbe decided that this activity must go on in all the cities, he would call in Bochum in the age of 18, 19, and say, you cannot think only for yourself, you have to go out and settle in a city somewhere. So that was, in a certain sense, the beginning of the activities of his, his, his being a Rebbe. He was staying in contact with all these people that was sent to all the cities. And they stayed there till today, and they're still there. Some of them have already passed away, and they lived their whole life there, running schools. This was just the beginning, and the foundation of these new activities. And then, after the Rebbe took over, he was sending not only young people alone, but especially after the marriage, he would send couples to cities, and that's how we have thousands of them around the world now. It's not only in the United States, all over. But the foundation was in that eight years between 1942 and 1950. It was about Shabbos, two o'clock. I was in Williamsburg, I came to show. Then a person came over to me and he said, something terrible, something bad happened. I said, tell me what? He said, I cannot tell. I said, something in my house? He said, no. I couldn't figure out what he meant. Then he told me. I didn't want to believe him. He said, the rabbi passed away. He couldn't see anything. It was thousands, maybe 10,000 people were in Eastern Park who were school from Kings Avenue to New York. He couldn't go. It was a very big crowd, all kind of Jews, Hasidim, other Hasidim, Rebbes, Rabbonim came. Till Bedford Avenue, they carried him on the shoulder. Then from Bedford Avenue was cars and buses. The Rebbe's demise was like the sun, just unexpectedly setting, not in time at all. But at the same time, everybody felt that there is a successor. This is the Rebbe. The only one who didn't accept it, in fact, was the Rebbe. He was against it. The Rebbe started saying he has no horaot, no special instruction for that. In other words, that the previous Rebbe did not give him any instructions. This was going on for quite a while. We had meetings, and I said, let's ask the, the, the Ramash, we called him. Let's ask him, he should just say Amayim HaChasid. Amayim HaChasid is, is a Hasidic discourse, which the, the Rebbe said. And when he will say it, we'll all stand up, which we do only by the Rebbe and so on. He didn't want to do it. He said he has no instructions for it. He doesn't, he's not worthy for it. He has no instructions for it, and that's it. It was very serious. 
serious about it. He certainly did not want to take it. And it came to a stage that he told one of the elders, Hasidim, that if they'll bother him too much, he'll, he'll, he'll run away and people will not know where he is. And what we decided is that we went on the Ohel, on the grave of the previous rabbi. And we put a note, we read a note, that we, we remained like sheep without a shepherd. And we all see that the proper person is the Rebbe's younger son-in-law, and he says that he doesn't have any instructions. So if instructions is needed, he should get the instructions. After that, he never heard from the Rebbe anymore, this excuse, never. He actually started immediately answering questions, giving advice and so on, and there was immediately miracles in the, answer of the, of the answers of the Rebbe, immediately. But he didn't, uh, officially, they wouldn't accept it, wouldn't accept it. It lasted practically close to a year, because in the following year, a new Shvat, the Rebbe already, the Rebbe the Rebbe, the Rebbe Rengen, the Rebbe said already, my Hasidis, and so on. The Rebbe and his wife told him, how can you see the 30 years of self-sacrifice of my father, my saintly father, should go in vain? The, the previous rebel was of the leader for 30 years. How could you see that? And that from her side, this was the greatest sacrifice because she knew the rebel and she knew what she will have to withstand when he becomes a rebel. As for the, no days and no nights, and the, she had a great role in it, that in the rebel's decision. Because Rabbi Schneerson was born in a unique era in which uh, when he became Rebbe it was during the crisis of World War II and, and the Holocaust era and when so many Jews had just been destroyed. He knew that something had to be done to bring together the remnants of the Jewish people after the Holocaust. And so he knew that Jewish education was very important. And so then the media developed at the same time, the electronic media, and Jews were searching for their roots. So all these things came together at a unique moment in history so that uh, he was successful in uh, garnering support and raising interest. He's opened the doors of Jewishness to those who really want to understand what it's about. And he's changed the face of the Jewish world. He's changed it in terms of Jews accepting Jews, Jews being responsible for Jews, Jews bringing Jews back to their Jewishness, Jews responsible for the general world, Jews in terms of their consciousness, Jews in terms of their responsibility charitably, socially and so forth. He's changed the world of Jewry. They're great promoters of religion. They were the first to create the Hanukkah candle lighting ceremonies, the various shopping centers, first to have the mitzvah tanks, first to have the Purim parades. They actually created an awakening. I think he's a great leader, great delegator, and I think he has a vision, he has vision. And I can only liken him to some business people who have the vision of creating huge corporations. It's a movement with a special philosophy and with a special way of activity, of action. You can meet the Chabad Hasidim everywhere in the world, and they are doing a very important job. People are, are looking, and they need people to come out and help. And that's what we're here to do. The reaching out to others, or you might say reaching in. After a while, it caught on. Other groups started doing the same thing that Lubavitch uh, implemented, and it became again fashionable. Now you have many, many uh, synagogues, organizations that are reaching out to others, bringing secular Jews back into the fold, to the heritage. It was unfashionable at one time, and it was Lubavitch that, that, that took that unpopular, unfashionable, almost unacceptable stance because of the foresight of the leaders of Lubavitch, and in our case, the Rebbe, who saw that this was the way to go. It is uh, monumental, it is extraordinary, and in a, in, if in a lifetime we come to hear or to know of one person like that in, our, in a person's life, it is extraordinary. And uh, yet, uh, he sets an example that I wonder how many people are, are aware of. Uh, he could have chosen to, to move his uh, headquarters uh, to move his flock um, to much more comfortable, uh, much safer surroundings. And I think by his choice uh, of staying, 
in, in, a, in a very difficult setting and environment, he should give hope and inspiration to people uh, that you don't abandon, you don't leave, you don't turn away from your religion or from your home uh, for expedience. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, that he sets an example, uh, not only for the, for the Jewish community, uh, but for people of goodwill. I went to visit uh, a Lubavitch school in the East End of London in the early 1970s when I was Minister of Education for uh, Great Britain. Yes, I was very impressed with it. I was very impressed by both the scholarship and the behavior of the children, by the total dedication of the teachers, and by the great interest and involvement of the parents. And it seemed to me that that gave one almost everything one needed in education because what they were being taught was everything that's good, everything that is founded on a strong moral basis and personal responsibility. And after all, liberty itself is a moral quality. It derives from the sanctity of the individual. And of course, your Ten Commandments are addressed to individuals, and therefore they are responsible for their behavior. And they must be taught at a young age all that's very best in their way of life, way of life of their parents, their religion, and their country. I wish to honor leadership itself in all that is good, honest, just, and in our way of saying it, a good report and founded upon the great creator to whom we owe everything. The philosophy is very different. Um, most of the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox are very, they want to keep to themselves. They're afraid of uh, modern uh, life and the influences, drugs and, and, uh, and crime and all this. They're very worried, so they try to be insular and to keep to themselves. Chabad is different from all of those and that they're not insular. They want to go out and try to influence other Jews. Um, the ultra-Orthodox want nothing to do with television, video. It's treif, it's considered, because you shouldn't touch such things. But Chabad says that anything, that can, any tool that can be used to benefit the Jewish people is kosher. So they use videos and uh, and broadcast satellites and everything else, and they're very open. So uh, they're very different. That they don't exclude people. They try to uh, uh, bring people together. That turns some people off because they say, "What do they want from me? Leave me alone!" You know, so why bother me? Uh, but it's a very activist approach, which the others don't do very much or don't do at all. There was no such a thing before. To go out on the street and catch a yeet and put a mount fill in, there was no such a thing. Although the previous rabbis spoke in the same manner, but to make a campaign to go out on the street and get people, get people to put on tefillin, it, it looked even to, to some Hasidim, it looked strange. These young people that had to go out on shlichut, had to go out to all the furthest places, it was a great sacrifice. It wasn't before there was somebody, if the previous rabbi wanted to send somebody, he would go. But it, was, it wasn't natural. It wasn't natural. He had become a natural thing. It became the wish of every student to become a shalia, to go to a place where you would suffer materially and spiritually, ready for any sacrifice, only to go in a shlichut of the Rebbe. This, this spirit that the Rebbe brought in, it wasn't a coach. He didn't coach it. it as a matter of fact, he didn't even say to a shalia, you go. He just spoke about it, and the shluchim themselves came and offered themselves. What's difficult, but when uh, you know why you're here for, makes life easier. When you know who sent you, and, and, and you, you see results of your work. You see the appreciation of the people, the appreciation of the rabbi, the appreciation of the old people you take care of, and the kids you teach, and the people of the city. This is what keeps us going, the fruits that we see. You know, I was a bit afraid when I came. I didn't, we didn't know anything, we didn't know the people, we didn't know the language, we couldn't even say hi, goodbye. And just when we came, the first Shabbos, there was, there was 500 people waiting for us. I mean, 
How could we resist? My husband made the kiddush, I lit the candles, people didn't, people never saw this before and just the fact of, of bringing, bringing something back to them which they haven't seen for 70 years and as we go on we meet more people and more people come to school and we have a mikvah and we have all these things and I feel like I'm doing something and I can't, just can't leave them. Is the first person that really took the responsibility of the Jewish people. So I'd like to say, okay, pick up uh, your sleeves and let's do something. The Jewish world is dissolving. I see here the Italian community would disappear in a few years. There is no future for it. And uh, I think that uh, if we don't come here and really give uh, a big uh, push to it, uh, there would be no future for them. To find the fabric of Jewish identity fraying at the edges when we, uh, uh, when we have a Jewish state, when we have the possibility of coalescing ourselves, uh, that is a particular kind of tragedy. And what the Lubavitcher movement has been doing under the leadership of the Lubavitcher Rebbe has been to stop the fraying uh, and to bring Jews back into the fold. And I was particularly impressed with that. Uh, and uh, I, I value it enormously. In this city, we really came to a, a desert. There was nothing. We didn't need only bring in Yiddishkeit, Judaism to the people. We brought them happiness. People were not happy. And we explained the people that one of the biggest mitzvahs is to be besimcha, to be happy. And we bring them simcha and happiness. Our, we are not making everybody religious or everybody Hasidim. But each one of them should just make another mitzvah. There's action, there's done a lot of talk, they do things. Right. Well, they have villages and centers to help people that need help, and, uh, uh, people that are in trouble, uh, they can turn to them for help. And in New York, they have centers there too to help people. In other words, an organization that helps. I've seen them active on university campuses in England, um, particularly in the remote campuses where people don't generally have much contact with Judaism as such. Um, and when they aren't a deep concentration of Jews, so um, Chabad do tend to reach these outposts, um, and that's sort of very, very impressive. There are a lot of people out there that are lost or maybe on the fence and need that little bit of reaching out just to bring them in. And I, I think it's tremendous. And they've got the right attitude. Uh, they're fantastic people, the Lubavitch. And uh, I, I think the, the way they do it is it's not too pushy. And uh, they do let you be. Uh, they let you be comfortable with what you're doing and don't force anything. You're the one that takes the steps to go a little bit further all the time. The attitude is do what you can and you'll do a little bit more each time. We weren't at all religious but we were always traditional Jews and from being nothing and we've suddenly, my husband's Shomre Shabbat, I'm trying to get to that. And my children are, I've got a son of seven and a daughter of five, and they, their favorite thing is to wake up on a Saturday morning and get dressed and come down to show and see everybody and daven and, and it's wonderful, it's really enriched our lives, very much. What he's doing for Jews in all the world, he sends people, makes school like this, in Moscow, in England, everywhere. So Jews, they are making, they are coming closer. They love each other, and it's great. Instead of spending uh, Passover with their families at home, they go out to army bases and run a seid there for soldiers. And soldiers are impressed by this dedication. They give charity. They are selfless. I know of many, many non-religious people who, when they see the smile of these Chabad people, they agree to do what they are asked to. You see them in the army. Uh, you see them during the war, you see them in the most dangerous places during wars, which means they are everywhere and they believe that they are discharging a job which is to bring about the Hasidic Torah of Ahavat Israel, of loving people, helping them to understand their religion, helping them to bring them nearer to concepts and customs of Judaism. In the case of the Rebbe, he did take an interest in far more than the uh, orthodox religious ceremonial and spiritual values. He was interested in seeing that the lives as lived in the real world were improved. 
And that, I thought, was quite unusual. By us giving advice in material matters is much more than giving advice in spiritual matters. Because spiritual matters is a question of knowledge. Material matters is a question of prophecy. If you take in the totality, all those, and absolutely infinite number of instances when the Rebbe advised people, save their lives, save their, their uh, possession, uh, gave them a possibility to achieve a goal in a much faster uh, time than it would be normally achievable. Uh, that brings to a conclusion that we deal here, I would say, rather not with an outstanding person, but I use a term characterizing the Rebbe that he is not only an outstanding personality, not only an absolute unique human being, not only a writer's man and, and the uh, best Torah scholar I ever could imagine exists, but he is a kind of a phenomena in this generation. You always realize that it was a person that although he was very human in his approach to others, very realistic and very practical and very loving and caring, at the same time there was a dimension which is probably indescribable that you felt greatness and uh, this continued to mount over the years because the closer you got the more distant you felt the rabbis used to say about the Aaron the ark that contained the tablets that the ark carried those who carried it but those people who carried the burden of Torah with most sincerity felt that they were made lighter thereby and lifted by it. And the remarkable energies of the rabbi show to me not only that he sets a very tough example for all his followers to carry on and to imitate and thus lifts all of them, but that he himself is lifted in the process and given energies that someone with less faith and less spirituality couldn't possibly have. In all generations there is a Mashiach. In reality, the word Messiah comes from Mashiach, which is anointed. The King of Israel was the Mashiach of his time. Many students refer to their Rebbe as Mashiach because their Rebbe was perfect. We perceive the Rebbe as being the perfect person, as the person who is totally dedicated to the objective of making the world a place that was intended by God for it to be. Mashiach will come to bring us a world, as Maimonides says, where there will be no illness and no hatreds and no jealousies and no wars, and there will be goodness and kindness and compassion, as we are all looking for. Great leaders, great masters who have seen the Rebbe and have seen his writings have said that this is a leader that one cannot fathom could have been in this generation, and we are literally fortunate that this is our leader for our generation, and the one that hopefully will open the doors of exile and bring us to the Messianic Advent. It's clear that the Rebbe is one of the very greatest Jewish leaders of this century. It's clear also that he's reached out, as few other Jewish leaders have done, beyond the Jewish world, calling on people to pursue religious knowledge and religious values. And in that sense, I think he is one of the great figures of our century.